Welcome to Channel 17, the Town of Colony Government Channel. Hello and welcome to The Money Factor. I'm Richard Naylor, your host. Today we're going to be talking about going back to school, getting advanced degrees, getting more education in general. And our guest is Dr. Thomas Denham from Careers in Transition. He's been with us a few other times, helped us through resumes, a lot of other aspects of finding a job, and I want to welcome you back. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Good to be back. We're going to talk about something that is so topical right now. Mm -hmm. uh, it seems like every day in the paper, we pick it up and there's something about what we're talking about today. Mm -hmm. uh, before we get into just in general going back, I, I want to just kind of go over that there are different ways to get education. Mm -hmm. And we were talking before the show about liberal arts and skilled trades. Could you just address kind of the, the panoply of options that people have out there before we get into why would you do one or the other? Okay. Well, the first thing we should do is back up. Every show that we do, we talk about the career development process. So this would be a good time to, to, not, break to, that. to not bring that tradition <laughs> and also to frame our conversation. Good. So the three steps are self-assessment, career exploration, and action plan. In self-assessment, you answer the question, who am I? Career exploration, you answer the question, where am I going? And then the last question is, how do I get there? And the how do they get there is three options. You're either going to do a job search, go back to school, or start a business. And I'm going to refer to this framework as, as we go through. That's great. Uh, I think I was starting to get the cart before the horse. That's what most people do. That's why I said I have to frame this first. So most people are thinking, I have to go back to school. I have to get an education. But if you haven't answered that second question, where am I going, or where is this degree going to take me, then you run into problems. What people do is they don't answer that question. They get into a degree program midway through when it starts to get tough or they're studying in the middle of the night, and they say, why am I doing this? So the first thing was self-assessment, and maybe we come back to that. The second thing was uh, the job market? Or oh, career exploration. Ca career, okay. That's yes, career kind exploration. Of the general, yes. Of the general topic. Yeah. Now that fits in with what I was saying. There, there, there's a lot of options there's for There's all people. these options. But it, it goes back to self-assessment. Self-assessment is your skills, values, interests, and personality traits, what you're passionate about, where you're going. You've got to decide what is the destination. You don't want to go to a liberal arts program if your destination is nursing. So you have to decide that destination ahead of time. So then you build the last step, action plan. Then you build an educational program around that. So it goes back to asking the question, where do I want to go personally and professionally? Well, I'm going to throw away this whole sheet of paper. Then we're going to start all <laughs> over. <laughs> Let's go back to who I am then. How do you figure out whether you want to do, I want to go to community college, uh, I want to go to a trade school. I want to learn welding. Uh, I want to get a liberal arts degree. I want to be a doctor. How do, you, how do you decide which way to go? Wow, Richard, you are really scattered. It's true. You don't have a focus. <laughs> OK? So that's, I mean, that's the work I do. I mean, that's why people hire me, is to back them up into self-assessment and have them get a focus. Now, I've got a couple clients right now that are teenagers, 17, 18 years old, and they're thinking about their future college plans. So I'm backing them up, and I do a couple things. One is career counseling, two is um, a questionnaire, and three is assessment testing. So I use all those three methods to help them explore their options. Especially for somebody who's young, you don't want them to pick one thing because two-thirds to three-quarters of college students change their major. So you don't want to pick something very narrow because it's, a, it's likely that they're going to change. Right. Anyway. That's why sometimes a small liberal arts college can be a, a very good An eye -opener. optioner. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, a place like Union College, for example, is also a nice option because they've got liberal arts, but they also have engineering if you wanted to specialize in something what, like that. What about what they like? How does that come in? 
Well, most students are occupationally illiterate. They don't know what's out there. Their number one source of information is, is through the internet and television. So they don't know all the choices that are available to them. So they pick the traditional thing, doctor, lawyer, nurse, uh, engineer. Th those are the things that they know, and then they get into them, and they have no idea that they could have done this, this, and this, and this. I actually have an assessment tool. Uh, it has 1,600 different jobs on it. And I have my clients go through this list and write down the top, to highlight all the ones that have interest. And then I have them write down the top 25. And then I get it down to 10, and then I get it down to 3 to 5. 3 to 5 I can work with. So regardless of age, I'm trying to get people down to 3 to 5 options. And then you build an educational program around that. So if you want to be a liberal arts professor, you need a PhD. Okay. What I don't want is people going off and getting a PhD and not knowing why they are doing it. Because I guarantee that they're going to get halfway through the doctoral program. It's going to be a huge expense. It's going to be um, uh, a lot of stress. And they're going, to, they're going to quit. And that's what happens. If you don't know why you're doing this educational program, you'll drop out. Now, the landscape today, and, and today we're talking about this, is persistent underemployment, unemployment, and an economy that is hopefully slowly coming back. Mm -hmm. We have local development, such as CNSE, the Global Foundries is mm -hmm. uh, getting their welding torches out. I saw that in the paper, people actually welding things together today. So we have a lot of skill sets that are, that are maybe in the future, but not enough things going on for people to get a job. Mm -hmm. There's something like six for each job, or I, I know right. it's a little, it's not worse than it was, but there's still right. too many historically. So that's the reality that people find themselves in. Are people going back to school? Are you finding, are you getting people back into school? There's always a big uptick in applications during a recession. So if you talk to the schools around here, especially the graduate schools, they are seeing a resurgence in um, people applying and enrolling in school. And I think that the real benefit of thinking this through is what you were saying before. You know, I came up with an article which said that somebody went back and they got trained as a welder, but then they still couldn't find a job. And you said? I said that that person should have done research in their area about what the job prospects are like before laying down that kind of money. In that area... And you picked that out of the article. You said, hey, this is, uh, this is Rust Belt. That's right. It was in a Rust Belt area, and this person was competing against other people that were more experienced. And my sense is this person is not willing to relocate to other areas where that career is in higher demand. And so that's, you have that kind of a situation. So I, that's really the important thing. Now more people are going back and getting trained. Mm -hmm. And we've seen a trend. Uh, I found another article. More people are... Mm -hmm really in favor of skilled trades. And we heard this before. There are not mm -hmm. enough electricians. There are not enough plumbers. They're busy all the time. So one comes to the door and you say, how's it mm -hmm. going? They go, whew, yeah. busy. But it's not necessarily that that's what any, in, any given individual in any given place, you're saying, is really going right. to be successful. Right. I mean, it's the same thing with nurses. We do have a nursing shortage. If you, you open the newspaper, there's opportunities in there. But if you're not interested in it, you don't have the aptitude, you, you don't think you're going to be skilled at it, and that's not where you want your professional career to go. Regardless of the fact that it pays well and it gives you job security, you're not going to, be, you're not going to have career satisfaction. You're not going to be fulfilled. You'll have a paycheck and you'll have benefits, but every day you'll wake up and say, yeah, I really don't want to go to this job. So what's the point? So in a way, I guess I could ask you if there's a difference now and before. Uh, you've been a, a career counselor for you've three weeks for a long time <laughs> 20 years now <laughs> <laughs> and you've seen a lot of people looking for work uh, some with a lot of skills probably and some with fewer mm -hmm. and you have to kind of get them to go in a good direction for themselves so how does somebody in this climate where we have more people than ever thinking yes I need more training obviously something's not working I'm not totally discouraged. I'm going to do something. Mm -hmm. How do you get them to avoid the pitfalls of jumping and being unfocused? 
Right. Well, it's okay that if somebody's unfocused. The first thing they have to do is acknowledge that they're unfocused. I really do believe people have a sense of what they want to do. They just need a coach like myself to help guide them and narrow it down. It's okay, it's okay if you're not quite sure what you want to do. It's not okay if you've got 25 things that you want to do. That's, that's career roundabout syndrome. But in terms of the reality of the world, how do, how do they not go about this wrong? Uh, if you're a technical school, you're not going to say that there really aren't that many skilled jobs needed, so don't pay us money and, and go here. They're going to only talk about why uh, you should go there. They're going to get, paint you a picture. If it's bad, they're going to paint it worse. I'm just being cynical, but I mean, doesn't it make sense? So how do you, how do you cut through all the advertising and... It's like buying a car, right? I guess that would work. <laughs> you see the ads for cars on TV, you see the ads for schools on TV, and you have to do your research ahead of time. Most now with people a car, don't do their research most people would spend more time researching a car than they would an educational program. That's a good, good analogy. And how, but how do you do it with an education? You know, we all know Consumer Reports, uh, mm -hmm. Fax Me the Facts, or Car Facts, or whatever that right. is. How do you know, how do you figure out if it's a good thing, uh, if it's a, uh, an occupation that has openings, if, if the school itself is first, first class? Right. Well, the first thing you have to do is step back and you have to decide what are the two to three careers that I'm looking at, that I'm exploring. Then you need to do research on those careers first. Get clarity on that. Not the schools, the careers Not themselves. Not the schools yet. See, the schools, you're jumping ahead here. Yeah. The schools are how to get there. I'm still interested in where you're going first. So if you did pick nursing, for example, what is the job growth for nurses over the next 10 to 15 years? Where do nurses typically work? A lot of older people. What, where, um, you want to pick a career that branches out as, as much as possible. You don't want to pick something that, that eventually dead ends. What are the alternative career possibilities in this uh, profession? So you want to get the, and some of that may be national data, but you also want to figure out what's the local market like. Right. Okay. So you figure that out first, get clarity on that, and then you build your educational program around that. So you'd want to know the reputation of the school. First stop would be the career center for me. I would want a, uh, we, sometimes they call them placement reports or a uh, survey of recent graduates. I know that um, Siena. We, we did that in the Siena College Career Center. And I think they, I most in, of them keep those. Yes, yeah. and they, use them, they certainly use them as marketing tools. So, um, yeah, you want to know, if people go through this program, where do they end up? Can you talk to any alumni about this program? Did they like the program? I mean, if, if you buy a car, you might talk to uh, a satisfied owner or any owner. What do you like about it? What don't you like about so it? So at least if they're glowing, you know that they haven't been in the repair shop every four weeks, and they know the, the children's names of the repairers. Right. <laughs> right? So, yeah. Uh, you know, talking to alumni can be very, uh, a very useful process. And they might you, know about the, the, the economic, I mean, not the economic climate, but whether there are openings. And right. You know, the campus is important. Library, facilities faculty, uh, classrooms, uh, faculty to student ratio, uh, other services, um, the Career Center. What kind of uh, services does the Career Center offer? Does the Career Center help alumni after you graduate, or do you have to pay a fee for that kind of service? So again, people spend more time you know, researching all the details of a car, uh, but they will oftentimes impulsively decide on a degree program, get halfway through it, and go, oh, this is not really what I want. Oh, I should have thought about that ahead of time. See, school is a very expensive place to find yourself. I guess I see that all the time. You know, somebody comes into the library, they want to they wanna work here. And it's not unusual that they say, if you ask them, why, why, why do you want to work in a library? What attracts you to the library? Well, it's, I just love reading. Well, we don't get to read while we're working. That's to help other people read. Right. So maybe that's not a good answer. Right. That, that's right. I, I once met a librarian 
who, who um, um, I said, oh, you must, you must read a lot of books. And he says, no, I don't read hardly any books because I don't have time because there's so many books, new books that are coming in. He like reads the back of the jacket. You know, there's you know, hundred, years, uh, yeah. you know, 100 books coming in a week. How can you possibly read right. any of these yeah. things? Um, but yeah, you have to, it, it always goes back to why. Why do you want to go into this field? And what you were doing is you were trying to scratch below the surface. I love to read. Okay, what are the other 10 reasons why you want to go into this field? So when you're thinking about choosing a profession and an educational program, write down the top 10 strengths and weaknesses of going into this field. And Get maybe run those by paper. somebody who does it. Exactly. Says, run it by a career really? counselor. Run it by another professional. And get other opinions on this thing. I mean, just like you were going to buy a car, you would think, I'm going to pick this car, this car, or this car. And you maybe would, you'd talk to somebody. What do you think about this? What do you think about that? What do you think about that? And I'd certainly drive it. You'd take it for a test run. So now can you go to some of these schools and take a class you could without take a test run. matriculating? You could, you could sit. You could observe a class. You could certainly take one class as a non-matriculated student. I did that. Uh, in my master's program, and then I applied and got accepted. Um, so yeah, you want to be buyer beware. I know in my doctoral program, almost half the people in my doctoral program dropped out. They didn't know what they were getting themselves into. It requires great half sacrifice. Is a lot. And they probably already invested quite a bit in that semester. Right. Oh, no, I'm talking about like halfway through the program. Oh. <laughs> Halfway through the program, they oh, all wow. dropped out. They had no idea how long it was going to take. How many thousands of dollars they'd already spent. And effort, and plus the sacrifice. I, I sacrificed a lot to, to get my doctoral degree. Now it's certainly paying off. Um, but you have to take those things into consideration. Are you willing to make the sacrifices in order to get this? And the degree is not the end in and of itself. It's, um, it's a tool to get you somewhere else. So, for example, my bachelor's degree is in liber is liberal arts degree. It's an economics degree. So that's like the foundation. Then I went on and got a master's degree in higher ed administration, which is extremely small, sp sp yeah, right, right. specific. Yeah. So I got further training in a specialty, and that's what I think graduate education is all about: getting further training in a specialty. And then I got a doctoral degree, and it's a doctorate of education, specialization specialization in, in higher ed administration, and then. There's a career development sub specialization, and then the further specialization is internship programs in schools of business, which is really tiny. very, very specialized. But um, actually, nobody asked me about any of my specialties. <laughs> they just called me Dr. Tom. They, I mean, I could have a, a PhD in basket weaving. Uh, well, I'd ask you where you got it. Yeah. Harvard or <laughs> so, um, so that's that's we're getting we're going toward a more credentialed society, not less. The bachelor's degree today is what a high school degree was 20 years what ago. What was that quote you had before about um, high school? How many people are out of work? Of, of the of of the of the six over six million people that are out of work right now that have been unemployed for over six months, and that's not over long. half of them, 54% of them, have either a high school degree or less. That's shocking. It's, it's, maybe it's, it shouldn't be surprising, but. And those jobs are not, those jobs for those people are not coming back. It depends the on far different picture. Sector, they're not coming back. So we're going we're gonna to have to have more degrees. So a, a master's degree now is what, a, is what a bachelor's degree was 20 years ago. So, and what you're going to see in your lifetime, especially in my lifetime, is you're going to see the advent of the double masters. That is going to be the credential of choice. And of course, you know, uh, JDs, medical degrees, doctoral degrees, PhDs, things like right, that. Right, right. What about certificates, uh, electricians? Uh, I mean, uh, it, that's all the same thing, right? It, all, it always depends on what job you're going to apply to. Some people get certificates, and they, they get the wrong certificate. Or they get through the program, and they don't want to do that. Pr pursue that, that kind of thing. You've got to do your research on the labor market. Make sure th there's two types of research. One is information on the self. And, and the second type of research is the information on the workplace.
Okay, and there has to be overall. You can do information on the self and find out you want to do. Uh, uh, I'd like know. to read. I'd like to write poetry for the TV stations. Y yes, <laughs> and you realize you do the workplace uh, research, and there's no market for that. That's nice. That's like getting a PhD in mythology and only wanting to work in Troy. <laughs> you know, talking like, about Turkey. <laughs> there's no, there's no market for that. Right. So there, there has to be a blend of those things. And again, the self, the self assessment is, you know, don't go into welding if you, you're not interested in it. And uh, what about location? Uh, it seems like a lot of people don't want to leave the area. Again, it goes back to sacrifice. I mean, my ancestors came from Ireland and they came over here with the clothes on their back and they made a lot of sacrifices to, to make it. And lately we've seen where people are not being as mobile. Uh, well, it, it, you know, I, I have a, a child and, you know, I really don't want to pick up this kid and move to, you know, some high growth area because my, my family's around here. So I think it's hard as we go through the life cycle and we get married and we have kids and we have houses. You really don't want to uproot that and your friends and your support network and, and move somewhere else. I, I understand that. But one of the problems we face uh, in, in Albany, we have a library school. Uh, I went to Bloomington, Indiana to library school. Mm -hmm. A lot of people who were living in that town or city, town, really loved it. And we'd love to stay there. But this library school is churning out librarians, many of whom would love to stay there. What are the chances? Nothing. Almost right. nothing. And if you, if you succeeded, it would probably be poor pay because there's plenty of people willing to do it for less. That's right. Willing to do it for free almost. Almost. <laughs> So you have to do your research ahead of time. It's, it's great that you're passionate about something, but is there a market? Or are you willing to relocate so you can pursue your dream? These are tough choices. Tough choices, especially for families yeah. and um, individuals within families. Yeah. I'm sure it was a tough choice for my ancestors to get on a boat to a country they had never been to. That's right. You know, and we're, that was a pretty big sacrifice. That was a huge sacrifice. Yes. They weren't moving to uh, you know, Massachusetts. They were moving to the New World. And they didn't know what to expect. And, and they had no family support over here, no one to help them. So you have to kind of put that in a context. So we should be brave. It should, you should not you, move because you're afraid not to, to, you not, have to decide, not to succeed. You have to decide what level of risk you're willing to assume. The higher the risk, the higher the reward. The lower the risk, the lower the reward. And you can also take a calculated risk. I got my, my uh, master's degree. I was working full time. I went to school part time. I got my doctoral degree. I was working full time. I, was, I was, went to my doctoral program part time. Today, it's a possible. lot of people are out of work, and so they're looking for something to get them back into work. And they may consider that, well, if it's really hard to find a job, and right now I'm not looking for one because I'm studying, and then I can hope that by the time I'm, I'm out, there'll be a job. Now, what right. do you think of that? What, what do you tell me if I come I think come it's a good theory. Um, now they're saying that the eight and a half million jobs that we've lost during this recession are not going to be recovered until 2014. That's, that's what economists are predicting. I can't go that long without eating. Right. I mean, people have bills to pay. So uh, this is going to be a long recession. In previous recessions, a lot of people, especially, especially college graduates, if we're in a recession, they just go off to graduate school and do that for two years. And by the time they got out, everything's rosy. everything would be rosy. Um, the only problem with that strategy is the key to success is education plus experience. So if you get a graduate degree, you have an undergraduate degree in economics, like I did, and then you go on and you get an MBA and you don't have any work experience, you got two very expensive pieces of paper. And, and I would guess that, and this may, you would know this better than I would, but if you're a recent graduate and now you're competing with a, a not so recent graduate, neither of you had any work, you're going to take the more recent graduate now. So if you it's don't unlike, get this timing right... Yeah, well, it's unlikely that the person that's been out for a couple of years is going to have no experience. You think they're going to... I'm going to hire... I, I'm going to hire the person that's got the three to five years experience over to the recent graduate. Because I, I know they're work... I, I know they're workplace tested. Okay. 
Yeah, now the person that's got the three to five years experience. If it's in something si totally else though. Well, that's, that's, another, that's another issue, you're right. Uh, the person that's been out for three to five years, that first months that they got out of the MBA program, they might not have been employed. Right, of course. But, but I'm still gonna take them over. The experience the, is certainly better. Uh, life absolutely. It's, it, that's the key, is to have the education plus the experience. And in today's labor market, without that piece of paper, oftentimes, regardless of what's written on it or where it's from or what your major was, without that piece of paper, they will not open the door for you. If you have 100 resumes and cover letters, and I did this once at Siena, I got 100 resumes and cover letters for a job that was posted in my office. So I'm hiring, I'm hiring this person. Wow. I'm going to hire a person for an assistant director position in my office. 100 resumes and cover letters come through. I stacked them all up, and I, I used a ruler to see how I, it was six inches tall. Wow. It was six inches tall, okay? So I don't have a lot of time to read through these things. So what am I looking for? For my office, in a career center, I needed a master's degree. I went through all of them. If you didn't have a master's degree, it went in the no pile. Now, half of those people probably could do the job. But with a master's degree, now I see somebody that not only got a bachelor's degree, they did a second level of accomplishment. They were able to set a goal and complete it. It also helped me get the stack of 100 resumes down to 20, okay. which was more manageable. And then you know what I did? I actually read the resumes and cover letters. And that's probably more than some people do with 20. So the degree was a screening tool. Another reason why we have to do it. And the problem is when you're an adult, it's very difficult to go back to school. I know this. I did it twice. but It's not impossible, but you have to be hyper-focused on that this is what you want to do and that um, this education is going to um, propel you forward in your career. Do you ever find people who are self-conscious about, oh, I'm old and I'm, I'm going to class with younger people and maybe they're going to think I'm stupid or whatever? Yeah, I, I, I think some people um, have that apprehension when they first start out. I guarantee you, after two classes, they'll say, oh, I don't know what I was worried about. Now, That's good to know. If, if you've been out of the classroom for a number of years, let's say you've been out of the classroom for, 30. Ten, for, for 30 years, and then you go back and you start to study organic chemistry, Gonna yeah, that's going to be really <laughs> hard. You start to study nanotechnology, they, yeah, that's going to be really right. hard. So you but better, if, you know, if you're going back for something like an MBA. That you can do. Right. It, if you've been out of the classroom for 30 years and you go back and you study for an MBA, you might have 30 years of experience that you could bring into this You'll classroom. You'll actually understand what they're talking about. Right, right. You know, so that, that really does work. We have a little more time, and this is a really hard problem, so I didn't leave you a lot of time to solve this, but funding. You know, we've read um, just this week in the Times Union that the HESC, which is the Higher Education Services mm -hmm. Corporation for New York, which handles student loans, has a record amount of delinquencies, mm -hmm. people who can't pay their student loans back. So we know a lot of people are getting the education. Mm -hmm. They're either not getting the job or they don't know how to budget. I assume they're not getting a job. Mm -hmm. How do you fund education these days and feel like you might have a chance to survive on the other end? This is where I plead the fifth. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard, no? Well, the, the thing is that I, as a career counselor, I help people explore their options and I help people make academic and educational choices, but I'm not a financial aid expert. So, so that's need... why it's so important to sit down with somebody. Uh, first of all, let's go back. Do the self-assessment, right. explore your careers, narrow them down to two to three, do the research on those careers, explore your options in terms of the educational programs, what are the requirements for applying, how long is this going to take, facilities, faculty. How uh, long is it going to take to assessment. get a job after I get my that's, certificate? That's right. And, uh, and sit down with somebody in financial aid and compare, compare these, these prices. Now, this might be a good time when you have a spouse who's willing to work you through this. Right. But if you're on your own, it's going to be interesting. It, it depends on the school. It depends on the program. That's usually my answer in career counseling. But people should depends. look for other funding sources. Sometimes right? you can go to a college or university, and you'll get a scholarship, and they'll pay for everything. That's rare. We had, we had some Siena people in who were from the guidance office. Mm -hmm. You worked in the yeah. Siena. And they were saying there are very few students who don't have financial help. Yes, the, the, but the 
the underneath is how much of a financial aid package. I mean, my alma mater, I think 85% of the students get some form of financial aid. The question is, what kind of form? I mean, the, you, yes, for a place like Siena, you're going to get a grant. You're going to have a work study position. You're going to have your contribution. You're going to have your parents' contribution. And then you're going to have a loan. Now, when I graduated from college, I think I had like $8,000 in loans. A lot of people are coming out with 10, 20, 30, 40, 50,000 dollars in loans. Right. Especially if you're thinking about a graduate program or you're thinking about going to law school. Average law school is over 50,000 dollars, and you got to do it for three years. It's 150,000 dollars. That's going to be a lot of money, even at a low interest rate. That's why lawyers even at charge a low a lot. interest rate. <laughs> That's why lawyers charge a lot of money. Right. Because they're trying to pay back their loans. Right. right. So you know these are uh, things that you have to take into consideration. Again, that goes back into the sacrifice piece. What are you willing to sacrifice time-wise, financially? Um, effort. Effort to get where you want to be. So my, my answer to your question is talk to somebody in financial aid. Do your research. Do your and, homework. And, and plan ahead, right. Plan ahead. Got to have a plan. Now, I don't want to end without being a little more positive. Uh, yeah, financial aid is a downer. A downer. <laughs> and we have, a, we have a nation where we have a lot of people with no advanced skills. And we have the potential for amazing technological progress. And so the idea in the past was, well, the machines are going to do everything. But now we know mm -hmm. there are going to be fewer jobs to make a lot of radios or something. But the person mm -hmm. who has the job has to have more skills than the pigeon. Mm -hmm. So you know, how can we end on a positive note, letting people think about, yes, there's opportunity? Well, one is, you know, you can contact uh, the Department of Labor or, uh, yeah, Department of Labor and find out what are those trades and high growth areas. You could even go to Google and say top 10 uh, jobs for, th for the future. Identify those jobs, see which ones you're interested in, see what the educational requirements are, and then build a, build a strategy around that. And then be willing to sacrifice to get what you're looking for. Right. I mean, this is, this, you know, people came to this country because of opportunity. They didn't come here because they wanted to work nine to five. I mean, you look at the pilgrims, for example. Which I'm looking at very hard right now. <laughs> <laughs> really. Uh, you know, they, they came to this country, and, you know, if it was five o'clock in the afternoon, they just didn't punch out and say, you know, I got to go home to the wife. Yeah, if a deer was standing right there, they were going to shoot it. You know, if it was 7 o'clock at night, they'd shoot a deer. It wasn't like, well, I'm done with work. So there wasn't this, you know, clear division of, you know, work and, and personal life. And a lot of people um, need to understand that it takes a lot of sacrifice to get where you want. I mean, I started my own business. I didn't make a whole lot of money the first year. And when you do that, I've heard you don't plan to have a 9 to 5. You don't have a nine to five. You're happy but when I, you have work. Right? But I also took Tuesday off to go hiking with my daughter. So you have the freedom, but I have the freedom. But, but the then work, I have to make up the but time. The work I'll is famous. I, I, I'll have to work tonight. You know, I'll, I started work at seven o'clock this morning. I'll have to work until nine o'clock tonight. But I took Tuesday off to, to be with my daughter. So you know, I can in, in entrepreneurship we, we say you can work the the eighty hours of week that are required anytime you want. Right. <laughs> I like that. That's a good way to end. And, and just do it. Plan and do it. P plan and do it. And we are going through a period of more credentials, not less. No doubt about it. Yes. Thank you, Tom. Oh, it's great to be here. Great topic. Great show. And I hope you enjoyed the show. Hope that you come again and watch our show next time and that you have a great week. Till then, take care. Welcome to Channel 17, the Town of Colony Government Channel.